Well, happy week after Easter. It actually is still Easter. Easter is a season. In fact, Easter is life because we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus every time, every day, every moment of every day because it changed everything. I've got a personal question for you though this morning as we kind of get started. Does anybody in the room, you're among friends, anybody at home, you're definitely among friends. Um, anybody still have any of their Christmas decorations up? No, really, does anybody still have their Christmas decorations up? You see, I'm asking because we moved here from South Carolina, and there was a family in our neighborhood. We would walk our dog by their house every night, and they had their Christmas tree up year-round. Not only did they have it up year-round, they celebrated it year-round because they had those LED lights on it, you know? And so, um, you know, they would have the drapes open. You walk by around July 4th, the thing was red, white, and blue. You know, you'd walk by around Thanksgiving, it was, you know, kind of fall colors. Of course, we were near Clemson, so it was always orange, right? (laughs) They would just sort of get multi-use out of that, that Christmas decoration. But isn't it true for most of us, as soon as the season is over, we put it all in a box and we put it away somewhere. In Florida, it's kind of, you don't have a basement. Very few of us even have an attic. So we just sort of keep on to these decorations and we we just sort of deal with them until the next year and then we get them out again. Well, that's true not only of the decorations, but in so many times, it's also true of, of so many of the many beautiful biblical passages that talk about Jesus. One of those is found in Isaiah chapter nine. For unto us a child is born, Christmas, right? But look at who this child is. He's a son, is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called, say it with me, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now that's more than Christmas, isn't it? There's a lot going on there that's a lot more than just about a tree and a manger and some angels and shepherds. You see, Jesus is our mighty counselor. I don't know how many of you have ever been to counseling. I studied counseling in seminary. I've done a lot of counseling. I've actually been to counseling once or twice. And the thing about a great counselor is that they will rarely give you advice, but they will often give you a question. Anybody ever remember anything like that? Some of the best counselors will not tell you what to do. They will ask you either why you're doing something or why you want to do something. Questions reveal our heart. Questions reveal and get us under the first layer. Larry Crabb, a famous Christian counselor, says it this way, questions speak louder than advice. The best way to see truth is often on the other side of a good question. Now, what's interesting is, if you look at the ministry of Jesus through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are over 100 times Jesus will answer a question with a question. Jesus used this as a way to get beneath the the surface of what's going on. And so for the next several weeks, we are going to be looking at some of the questions that our wonderful counselor asked to get under the surface. Some of those questions are today, we're going to look at why are you so afraid? Next week, Pastor Paul is going to look at do you want to be well? On the 21st, we're going to be welcoming Sheldon, Pastor Sheldon, for his first sermon. I don't know if he's a guest or what, but he's not here yet. He's here, but he's not here yet. He's not here until the third week of May, but he'll be here the third week of April. You figure that out. But he's going to be our, 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 our preacher that day. And we so look forward to that, to getting together to meet him and to be with him and all of that. And then on the 28th, we're going to finish up with, do you believe I can do this? So today, we're going to be looking at a passage that you've probably heard many, many times. It's about Jesus. 
In Mark chapter 4, Jesus is preaching from a boat. Now, why is he preaching from a boat? The reason is because there are so many people there that they couldn't see him, nor could they hear him. And so he says, give me that boat and push out a little bit into the water. And then by God's wisdom, the water itself amplified his voice so they could hear him better. Also, they could see him better. This comes after a long day of preaching and teaching, after a long series and, and, and time season of him performing miracles and preaching and teaching and pouring himself out. And so when we get to this day, he's been preaching all day, he's on the boat, and he turns the boat into a question. Let's read it. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with them. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Notice all the questions that are in this short passage. He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, another question, why are you so afraid? Another question, do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, look at this question, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Father God, as we come to your word, we ask that you would use my words, Lord, as a way to penetrate, a way to understand that you are not just the risen Savior, that you are the Lord of all. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Well, if you've been around church at all very long, you've probably heard this passage, and it's a very, very comforting passage, especially if you're in the midst of a storm right now, but you've probably heard it preached something like there's this huge storm, the disciples are freaking out, right? Jesus is asleep. Somebody goes over and shoves him and says, hey, Jesus, wake up, don't you care? And then Jesus calms the storm, okay? Now, that's a, that's a very, very appropriate and applicable way to teach this passage. It's just not the way that it's supposed to be taught. In other words, that is a very, very great Western, if not American, view of this whole passage. I've got a problem. Jesus is my solution. I wake him up. He solves it. Right? But that's not what this passage is teaching. You see, the key is the question. The key to really understand what's going on in this passage to get underneath that surface layer, to really see what Jesus had in mind, to see why it's even in the Bible, is to look at the questions. And so we're going to kind of work backwards because the first question is the main question. Who is this? Who is this? Who is this guy in the boat who is this Jesus? Now, to get there, we kind of have to understand some of the things that are going on around it. Now, Israel is a land of contrasts, okay? Israel is, is a land where 30 miles is the difference between 10,000 feet of elevation. Did you realize that? You see, the Sea of Galilee, where we're talking about now, where Jesus is, it's a 13-mile wide by 8 feet mile long lake bigger than a lake smaller it's kind of like one of the great lakes right and it is 700 feet below sea level now if you just go about 30 miles the other direction and you go up 9200 feet you've got mount hermon and you can see there in the picture that there's snow on the top of Mount Hermon because it is so tall. In 30 miles, it runs all the way down to 700 
feet below sea level. Now, I'm not a meteorologist, but if you know much about meteorology, you know that cold air, when it hits warm air, what happens? It creates a storm. And that much cold air hitting that much warm air constantly provided turbulence for storms. And so the Sea of Galilee could go from absolutely still and tranquil to basically hurricane force winds in a matter of moments. Kind of like living in Memphis. Anybody ever lived in Memphis? In Memphis, it's right, right in Hurricane Alley. You could start your day with a beautiful day, and if it's during, not Hurricane, I'm sorry, Tornado Alley. And if it, this is her, anyway, that's the sad point. <laughs> you could start your day, it'd be beautiful, and around noon or so, the sky would start changing. And pretty soon it would become green when there was a tornado somewhere. And pretty soon it would become an eerie. Anybody ever been there? You know what I'm talking about? The, the, the whole sky turns like pea green. And then you know you got a problem. Because there's going to be a tornado any minute. Well, at the Sea of Galilee, they didn't even have that much warning. Because you see, the storms would just sort of come upon them. And that's what's happened here. They set out and in the middle of the, the sea, the storm just came upon them. Now there's a couple of things that we can learn from this. Storms are inevitable. Storms in our lives, storms on the Sea of Galilee, storms around the world, they're inevitable. Why? Because we live in a world that has fallen. We live in a fallen world. You see, when Adam and Eve sinned and broke that fellowship with God, not only did they take the human race down with them, they took all of creation down with them. That's why Paul can say, we know that the whole of creation has been groaning. That's why we know that when Jesus returns, he restores what has been taken. And it's a new heaven and a new earth the way it was always meant to be. You see, storms are going to be inevitable in our lives, and they are also unpredictable. You never know when one's going to come up. In our lives, it may come up with one phone call. You have a job, you, then you don't have a job. You have health, and then you get a report from the doctor, and all of a sudden, you're, you're concerned about other things. They're unpredictable, just like the storms on the sea of Galilee. But you know, there's another thing that we know about storms, and storms are amoral. Notice something in this passage. Jesus says, hey guys, let's go to the other side. Have you ever wondered what God's will for your life was? Well, in their case, they could articulate that. Let's go to the other side, okay? Jesus said, let's go, let's go. Okay, everybody pile in, let's go. They were in the middle of God's will, and yet they were in a storm. Storms are amoral. Most of the time, storms are not as a way to get, it's a part of life. Storms are amoral, but also storms are revealing. We're in the midst of a storm, it starts making you ask some really important questions, doesn't it? Like, who is this? Who is this? You see, that's the key to the question. Why are you so afraid? Let's just, I, I want you to look back at this passage with me a little bit. This is a this is about 150 words. It's such a compact. There's so much in here, but it's so short, about 150 words. And look at something very, very interesting. Look at this. He says, when evening came. Why is that detail there? Does it move the story? Maybe. Let us go to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along. And look at this, just as he was. You know what that means? Just as he was, he didn't go back on shore, he didn't get his stuff, he, he just said, okay guys, let's go. He had on what he was wearing before. Why do we need to know that? And then he goes on a little bit, uh, just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. We don't hear any more about those other boats, they were just there. 
Why all of this detail? A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. But Jesus was in the stern. If you're not a, a sea person like I'm not, I had to look it up. The stern is the back part of the boat, okay? He wasn't in the bow, he was in the stern, okay? Not only that, he was in the stern and he was asleep on a cushion. Why all the details? Because it really happened. Because this story is true. Because it happened this way, because it was remembered this way, because it happened this way. Why is that so important? Because what happens next you have to deal with because it actually happened. In other words, if this was a fable, those details wouldn't be there. But this was an actual reminiscence of someone who said, I was there and I remember all those other boats. And I remember we didn't even go to shore. We just went straight to the other side. Yeah, I remember all of that. And man, when the storm came up, Jesus was in the back of the boat. We're up there rowing and he's in the back of the boat. And not only that, he's a back of the boat asleep on a cushion. Okay? Anybody ever been on an overnight flight? Okay, remember the, the attendant comes down the aisle when it's about to be dark and you're flying over tons of stuff, you know, and she's like, anybody want a blanket and a pillow? In other words, what they're asking is, is anybody gonna get some sleep sitting straight up? Probably not, but we can at least try to help you because when you get that pillow, that means I'm out. Don't bother me, I'm out. Jesus was asleep on a pillow. Why the detail? because it was important to realize that what happened, what Jesus did, the rest of the story really, really happened. Because the question is, who is this? Who is this? Flannery O'Connor is a, a great writer. If you've never read any of her work, she's a a wonderful novelist, and she wrote a, a, a great book called a Few, a Few Good Men. And there's a character in that book called Misfit. Kind of fun, you know, the name is Misfit. And Misfit is dealing with and wrestling with who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And I've got, a, a, it's a rather long quote, but it, it really sets this up well. He says, when it comes to Jesus, we have one of two options. Say Jesus didn't exist, and if that's the case, then there's no reason to try to do good or be good because none of it will ever matter. Just live life on your terms. But on the other hand, if this Jesus did actually exist, that changes everything for us in the opposite direction. We must give up life as we know him, as we know it, and go all out and follow him. What we don't have the option to do here is to take Jesus as some nice person who offers nice advice that we can either take or leave. Why the detail? Because it actually happened. And that sort of forces us into a corner to ask that question and answer it. Who is this? Who is this? C.S. Lewis, in a very famous quote, follows up. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really thing that people often say about Jesus. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the level with the man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or a madman, or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher, he has not left that option open to us. And he didn't intend to. You see, the question beneath the question, who is this, is really the question for all of us, whether we're in a storm or not. Because you see, what happens next 
The storm is raging. The sea is churning. They're about to die. And you know what Jesus does? He stands up. And in maybe your Bible, it says, peace be still. That's kind of Hollywood. That's not really what the Greek says. You know what he said? Be quiet and stay quiet. Shut up and sit down. Now, why is that so profound? Because the wind and the sea obeyed. Immediately, the wind ceased. Immediately, the seas were calm. Why is that such a profound, big deal? Because, you see, the ancients understood. They knew that only God could calm the weather. It was uncontrollable. Only God himself could have done this. William Bright says it this way, the ancients would read this story and would see far more than Jesus wanting to calm the storms of our lives. In the Gospels, Jesus exercises divine authority over the sea, over the demons, over disease, over lameness. This is why disciples respond the way they do. They are filled with great fear and wonder because they understand only God himself could do this. So you see the question beneath the question. Yeah, yeah, Jesus can calm the storms, but why? Because he's God himself. Why all the details? Because the details point to the result and only God himself to do what Jesus did. And so all of a sudden, the storms in our life take on a whole different character. Because the second question is, teacher, don't you care? Don't you care that we are about to die? How many times have we asked that question? How many times have we gotten our eyes on the situation and say, Jesus, you must not be real. Jesus, you must not care. Jesus, where are you? Chuck Swindoll puts it this way. He said, their question revealed that their faith was in the boat, not in the Savior. You see why the questions get us a little bit deeper into the whole thing. And so we have to ask ourselves, God, why do you allow these storms? Why do you allow me to go through these storms? C.S. Lewis famously said it, God whispers in our pleasures. On a beautiful day, we may say, thank you, Jesus, and go right on. He speaks in our conscience, but he shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Jesus, don't you care? Jesus, don't you care that we are about to die here? I had a dear friend, of a great musician, probably the best guitarist you've never heard. I'm serious, great, great, great musician. He had visions of becoming a Christian rocker and changing the world. He moved to Los Angeles. He had all kinds of of people saying, you are the best, man. You're great. You're awesome. Let's put you on recording contract. They would all fall through. After five years in L.A., he gave up. He went back to Ohio, met and married an absolutely beautiful girl who ended up leaving him, and his world was falling apart. He was a devoted Christian, and he came back after all of that. We got together, and he said, Mike, I just don't even believe anymore. I just don't even believe in God anymore after so much disappointment. And I said, I am so sorry and I am so sad, but you need to understand, you were using Jesus as a means to an end and not the end itself. Francis Chan says it this way, if Jesus is to use someone who exists to calm your storms, then you are the center of your own existence and Jesus is simply your assistant.
That's a tough question, isn't it? And that's why Jesus says, if you know who I am and you know what I can do, if you know who I am, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? And I'll tell you why. Because it's only natural to know that Jesus has absolutely unmanaged, unmanageable power. And so he asked the question, why are you afraid? But our question is, don't you care? Jesus says, don't you know that I care? Don't you know that I can do anything? And we say, but if you loved us, why would you let these things happen to us? You see, our problem is, our premise is all wrong. Our premise is all wrong. You see, the storm is unmanageable. The storm, the waves, everything is crashing around. It's about to take them down, and that is absolutely unmanageable. But Jesus' power is equally unmanageable. But the difference is, the storm doesn't love you, but Jesus does. Anybody remember the Chronicles of Narnia? Remember Aslan? The, the lion figure who is the Christ figure who shows up and takes over and takes charge. When the children first meet him, they say, ah, is he safe? Ah, no, of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Is he safe? No. But he is good. This story shows us Jesus' authority over everything. Not only does he calm the winds, he calms the water. If you've ever been surfing, you know that three or four days after a hurricane is the time to hit the gulf because the waves are still churning. The waves are still churning. After a storm like this in a 13 by 8 mile lake, the waves would not only be churning, they'd be hitting into each other for hours, if not days. But Jesus says, be calm and stay calm. And the water went like glass. That's the power of Jesus Christ. And so that's why we have to ask the question, who is this? And if we understood that, we would say, why are you so Afraid. Tony Evans, I love the way he puts it. He says, your problem overrode my promise. So you're now living in light of the problem, no longer living in light of the promise. And when you live in light of the problem and no longer in light of the promise, the problem will dominate you. And it will make you forget the fact that I ever even made you a promise. Who is this? Why are you so afraid? Elizabeth Elliot picks it up. She says, God is, God is God, and since he is God, he is worthy of my worship and my service. I will find rest nowhere else but in his will, and that will is infinitely, unspeakably beyond my largest notions of what he is up to. Now, it's real interesting as we close here and get ready to come to the table Hopefully, as you've been thinking about and hearing this, it draws back to mind another Old Testament story. Remember the story of Jonah. Just like Jesus, Jonah's in the boat. Just like Jesus, there's this storm. Just like Jesus, somebody had to go wake up Jonah. Just like Jesus, they took a divine intervention. But Jonah says, throw me in the water and there'll be peace. Jesus speaks and there's peace. But is there? Because you see, Jesus, Jonah was thrown in 
and was rescued. Jesus was thrown in willingly on the cross and died for you and for me. Jonah came and proclaimed, Jesus rose again and paid the price. You see, the question is, who is this? Who is this? This is God himself calming the storm. I don't know what storm you might be going through today, but you were not in it alone because Jesus is in the boat. I don't know what storm you might be going through today, but Jesus has unmanageable power, which he displayed on the cross. Because that storm may threaten to swamp you, but it will not kill you. Because we celebrated last week, 1 Corinthians 15, that death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, but thanks be to God, he is overcome by the power of Jesus and the resurrection. And so my question to you and to me as we come to this table is, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? Jesus has won the victory.